Salam has said that all that is in the Quran is in the Surah Al-Fatiha and all that is in the Surah Al-Fatiha is in the Bismillah and all that is in the Bismillah is in the B of the Bismillah and all that is in the B of the Bismillah is in the point which is under the B and I am the point which is under the point Ma 
के मोला खबर लेते हैं अपना दामन खुशी से भर लेते हैं अपना दामन खुशी से भर लेते हैं अली अली मोला अली मोला अली 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 of Islam, the search for knowledge has been central to our cultures. I think of the words of Hazrat Ali ibn Nabi Talib, the first hereditary Imam of the Shia Muslims, and the last of the four rightly guided caliphs after the passing away of the Prophet, may peace be upon him. In his teachings, Hazrat Ali emphasized that no honor is like knowledge. And then he added, no belief is like modesty and patience, no attainment is like humility, no power is like forbearance, and no support is more reliable than consultation. Notice that the virtues endorsed by Hazrat Ali are qualities which subordinate the self and emphasize others. Modesty, patience, humility, forbearance, and consultation. What he thus is telling us is that we find knowledge best by admitting first what it is we do not know, 
and by opening our minds to what others can teach us. Ya Ali Madad, welcome, bienvenue. Thank you for tuning in to another Friday Night Reflections. My name is Rina Jessa, and I am honored to welcome all of our Jamaati members, multi-faith family members, and everyone tuning in from across the country and around the world. I am coming to you from my home city, Vancouver, British Columbia, and it is my pleasure to be your host for this evening's episode. Now, we are coming to the end of February, which means we can start looking ahead to spring. Although here in Vancouver, we just had our one signature snowfall for the season, I already feel like spring is in the air. I'm really looking forward to seeing the flowers blooming, the temperatures rising, and I'm really looking forward to our annual Cherry Blossom Festival that takes place here in Vancouver. I also hope you enjoyed last week's episode on the stories of our heroes. For me, Dr. Varani's talk introduced me to stories from our faith that I hadn't come across before. I also really enjoyed hearing your stories about your favorite Guinans and Casidas. This week has also been an exciting milestone as several provinces start COVID vaccination programs for seniors living in the community. I know a number of Jamaati members who live at home were able to get their first dose starting this week, and many more have appointments to receive theirs sometime over the next couple of weeks. Congratulations to all of you and your families. Hopefully, all of the elder members of the Jamaat across the country who are living at home will have an opportunity to get their first dose soon. It is a significant milestone and wonderful to see the light at the end of the tunnel growing brighter each day. Over the last several weeks, I have been reflecting on the many blessings and challenges that have come our way during this pandemic. As a step teacher, one of those blessings for me has been the ability to continue teaching BUI online and to be able to continue interacting with my students. Of course, this has come with its own set of challenges. And I know that teachers from across the country, right from pre-primary all the way to secondary, have been working so hard to enliven the curriculum for our students. We have been finding creative and innovative ways to ensure that their learning is continuing to be enjoyable and meaningful for them. We are so fortunate that the IIS secondary curriculum is full of so many rich and beautiful stories. Of particular importance this week are the chronicles on the life of Hazrat Ali, our first Imam. This week, we commemorate Yome Ali, the birthday of Hazrat Ali. In the curriculum, there is a story that highlights that Imam Ali's distinction was signified with his birth at the Holy Kaaba, where his mother used to go to pray. Even beyond the Shia interpretation of Islam, Imam Ali is recognized as one of the most important intellectual and spiritual authority figures after the Holy Prophet. Imam Ali is revered by Muslims as one of the four rightly guided caliphs, al Khulafa al-Rashidun. As caliph and as imam, Hazrat Ali established a paradigm for Muslim leadership centered on the values, ethics, and principles of Islam. In tonight's episode, we will have an opportunity to reflect on the life and legacy of Imam Ali. So with that, let's talk about tonight's program. We have with us tonight Dr. Hussein Rashid, whose scholarly work includes a contemporary reflection on the life of Imam Ali as a hero. Dr. Rashid will guide us through the life of Hazrat Ali and members of the al Bayt and the values and ethics we can learn from their example. We will then have a short presentation on highlights of Reza Shah Kazimi's important work on Imam Ali, Justice and Remembrance, Introducing the Spirituality of Imam Ali. We will then finish off, as always, with some beautiful musical expressions. And now, I warmly welcome Dr. Hussein Rashid to the show. Dr. Rashid is a modern-day Renaissance man. He has a BA in Middle Eastern Studies from Columbia University, 
a master's in theological studies focusing on Islam, and an MA and PhD in Near Eastern languages and cultures focusing on South and Central Asia from Harvard University. His research focuses on Muslims and American popular culture. His current projects include an independent film on wrongful terrorism arrests, a documentary on Muslims in America, and a children's television show, and a museum project on religion and jazz. He worked with the Children's Museum of Manhattan as a content expert on their exhibit, America to Zanzibar, Muslim Cultures Near and Far. Please welcome Dr. Rashid. Ya Ali Madet, Dr. Rashid, and thank you for joining us on tonight's program. Tonight we commemorate Yome Ali, the birthday of Imam Ali. Can you start by sharing with us the importance of commemorating events generally? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and ya ali madad. Rina, thanks so much for having me and really asking such a provocative question right off the bat. When we think about why we celebrate our holidays, right? The word holidays comes from holy days. These are times where we try to remember what it is for us as spiritual beings and bodies to cultivate our spirit. And so when we have these commemoration days, when we have these holy days, you know, I think there, there are three ways we can start thinking about it. One is we're trying to remember our history. We're trying to commemorate our history. Uh, and who is Imam Ali alayhi salam? Is, he's, of course, the first Imam and representative of the chain of Imamat. But we think about Imam Ali alayhi salam and the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, uh, and Bibi Zainab alayhi salam, uh, Bibi Fatima, uh, salam, and we think about all these figures. So the commemoration, first and foremost, is a way to place ourselves in history and, and tell us who we are. The second reason I would suggest that we do these commemorations is to say, this is how we got here. It's not just about the history, but it's also saying this is where we're at now because of where we came from. So it's not just about the history, but it's about understanding our present and what we owe the people who got us to the point we're at and what we owe the people who come after us. And thirdly, is that this is an opportunity for us to look at a role model like Imam Ali and say, there is something about Imam Ali that is so important that we must commemorate him. And we ask ourselves, why is that? So that these commemorations, these holidays, become a chance for us to catalyze, for us to think about who we are, why we act the way we are, and to recommit ourselves to bettering ourselves both materially and spiritually, for the sake of ourselves, our community, for the world at large. So I think these are some of the reasons why it's important that we start celebrating these uh, holidays. And this is true for Yomi Ali or any other religious uh, observation that we make. Thank you for that beautiful reflection on the importance of commemoration. The use of holidays and festivals to reflect on who we are and where we came from really resonated with me. Which leads me to my next question of why Yome Ali specifically? We know Imam Ali is important to us as our first Imam, but how is he revered by the broader Ummah? Are there specific examples or stories you can share with us? You know, Rina, when you talk about why we celebrate Yome Ali, we of course as Shia Ismailis recognize uh, Imam Ali's role as the Imam, as the first Imam. Uh, who who is divinely ordained to take over leadership of the community in political, religious, and spiritual matters. What I think we also have to remember is that Yom Ali is a commemoration of Imam Ali where the figure of Ali ibn Abi Talib is not just an Imam for Shia, but he's also the fourth caliph. He is, uh, very many Sufi orders consider him the first Sufi for many of the reasons that we as Shia consider him the first Imam, uh, but they have a very different theology around that. And so there's a great deal of love for the Al Bayt and Imam Ali specifically throughout the Muslim world. And so I think that when we talk about stories that tell us, oh, this is who Imam Ali is, we have to understand that he takes on different roles for different 
Muslim communities, not just Shia communities. And even amongst the Shia, Ismailis and Isnashris uh, and Boras have different conceptions of how Imam Ali functions. But I think the thing that we can recognize on Yomi Ali is that Imam Ali is a universal hero for Muslims. Now, the question you're asking about stories of Imam Ali, what makes him a hero? What makes him somebody that we want to emulate, somebody that we want to commemorate, something that somebody that Muslim communities around the world, regardless of whether they're Shia or not, turn to Imam Ali. I think this is such a wonderful and rich space for us to, to talk about because there are so many stories of Imam Ali that talk about his embodied ethics, right? He just doesn't teach ethics, but he lives the ethics. There's not a point where uh, he lives differently from the ethics that he's teaching. And so we can obviously talk about him as Imam, the divinely appointed uh, guide for the community. But there are stories that come before he is named the Imam by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. So for example, we know that Imam Ali was born in the Kaaba, you know, the, 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 the metaphorical center of the world, uh, physical world for Muslims, where for those who, uh, uh, when they practice the namaz, uh, are oriented towards Mecca. So that what we have here is a way of saying that from his birth, Imam Ali is sanctified, he's special, he is in an elevated position. But throughout his life, we keep hearing these stories of his compassion, of his commitment to truth, of his commitment to justice. You know, so we know that uh, at various battles, uh, the Prophet calls on Imam Ali to come. The Battle of Khaybar is, uh, you know, there are these Qawalis that tell this story of uh, the doors of Khaybar are shaking uh, when they hear the name of Imam Ali. Uh, the angel Jibrail comes and gives the Nadi Ali to Prophet Muhammad to summon Imam Ali because he is this heroic, valorous figure. But what we understand is this idea of fatua, of heroism, of Javan Mardi, of, of chivalry, is not just limited to battle, right? It's not just limited to him being a physical warrior. But there's this beautiful story told in the poetry of Rumi, where Imam Ali is battling his enemy, is battling an enemy, and they're sword fighting, and Imam Ali disarms his enemy. And his enemy spits on Imam Ali. And Imam Ali puts his sword away. He puts Zulfiqar away. And his enemy, who's, who is ready to die, says, Why are you putting your sword away? You had me. He said, Before when we fought, I was fighting for a just cause that was beyond me. When you spat on me, I became angry. And so if I continued to fight you, I was fighting for my anger, which is not a just cause. And so what we understand is that there is a sense of commitment to higher ideals that you always have to live up to, that you must always control your nafs, your ego, your desires, in order to be of the best service to God, right? And I think sometimes we see, we forget about this, this uh, motto on our volunteer badges of work, no words, which is very much an expression of that ideal. Work for the sake of God, not for the sake of recognition, not for the sake of your own ego. And so, you know, there's so many stories like this that permeate the tradition that it's, it's a joy to behold and a joy to partake in. The story of Imam Ali refusing to act in anger and only wanting to act in accordance with the ethics of his faith really struck me. It reminds me of the same commitment to ethical action we see in Maulana Hazri Imam today. And we see that through the work of the AKDN, which is described in the AKDN ethical framework as a contemporary endeavor of the Ismaili Imamat to realize the social conscience of Islam through institutional action. When we reflect on these stories, I wonder how those around Imam Ali were impacted and influenced by him. We hear a lot of stories about Imam Ali, but I would love to learn a little bit more about the Alal Bayt. For me personally, I would love to hear some stories about the women from the family of Imam Ali. Rina, you bring up a very important point for us right now, which is thinking about Imam Ali in relationship. I think sometimes we as uh, people who are struggling with how to live these ethics tend to fall into um, a trap of just particularizing one aspect or looking at one figure. 
And that's not how uh, the the blessed people of the house lived. They lived in relationship to each other. It is the al bayt, the people of the house. They were a family. They were in relationship to one another, right? We understand Imam Ali not just as an imam, not just as a caliph, not just as this historical figure, but as a man who was, uh, who was a loving father, right? The beautiful stories of his relationship to uh, Imam uh, Hussein alayhi salam, to uh, Pir Hassan alayhi salam, uh, and the ways in which he takes care of his children. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family says, Ali is to me as Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. Right? That's a very powerful statement. This is a familial bond. This is a, a brotherly bond that's established here. And this is true as well for Imam Ali as a husband. Right? When we talk about the ethics that Imam Ali embodies, it is thinking about his relationship to Bibi Fatima. When we think, for example, about Bibi Fatima's Tasbi, that is the Tasbi that was given to her by the Prophet uh, to, to think about Imam Ali when he's in battle, to pray for Imam Ali's success in one version of the origin story. There are other stories where we understand that Imam Ali refused to recognize uh, Abu Bakr as Caliph uh, un until uh, Bibi Fatima passed because Bibi Fatima said, do not recognize him during my lifetime. And so we understand that he has a loyalty, an affiliation, a commitment uh, to his family. And we see how that's transmitted. So if with Bibi Fatima, alayhi salam, we understand, we see uh, her commitment to justice when Abu Bakr and, uh, uh, and Umar come to her and try to take her inheritance from the Prophet, uh, the land of Fadak where she speaks and says, this is a gift from the Prophet, you have no right to it. And she stands in front of somebody who now claims leadership of the Muslim community, and she stands not only for her right as the Prophet's daughter, but for her right as the wife of the Imam. And we see that tradition continuing when Bibi Zainab salam, survives the massacre at Karbala and is brought in front of Yazid, the murderer of the Prophet's family, who takes glee in kicking the head of Imam Hussein? She stands there and curses him uh, to say that he has not succeeded, that he will be damned for eternity. And this is what Bibi Zainab does: is that worldly power has no uh, has no control over her because it is the power of the divine that has to be obeyed. And so that to obey the power of the divine is to always speak for justice, is to always speak for truth. And we see this because this is a family relationship, that, that whether it is Imam Ali, whether it is Bibi Fatima, Bibi Zainab, Imam Hussein, Imam Zain al uh, and so on through the generations, that there is always a commitment to servicing others out of compassion, that there is always a, a commitment to standing for truth and uttering truth, because that is how you get justice and that is how you tr transform society for the better. And these are some of the things that we as Murids are looking at and saying, how do we live this in our own lives? It is really inspiring to hear about these powerful women and their commitment to act in accordance with their faith. I always get chills when I hear the story of Bibi Zainab and imagine her standing there in Yazid's court. These stories of how members of the al Bayt lived in a manner so aligned with their faith and the example of Imam Ali makes me wonder how we today can live by the example and legacy of Imam Ali. Rina, when I think about how do we approach the teachings of Imam Ali, right? I mean, I think stories are such a powerful way to do that. But we have to be conscious that when we tell these stories, we're not just telling one type of story, right? It's not just Imam Ali the warrior. It is not just Imam Ali uh, the Imam who is guiding the community as a whole. But it is Imam Ali the father, it is Imam Ali the brother to the Prophet, it is Imam Ali the husband. Uh, it is Imam Ali the one who gives charity. When the Quran says your friend is Allah the messenger and the one who prays and gives charity, this is a reference to Imam Ali who while he's in prayer, a beggar comes in and he signals to the beggar for the beggar to take a ring off his finger. And so he doesn't interrupt his prayer, but at all times, he, Imam Ali recognizes that charity, charitable giving, and, and I have problems with that word in English, as the Imam has said in, in Tutsing, uh, that philanthropy, charity is not what we do. 
we we think about restructuring society, right? And the Imam Ali embodies that. And so we have to think about that intimacy of giving, that intimacy of thinking about what is due to others around us at all times. That it's not just I'm praying for myself, but I'm praying for the world. I'm praying for the transformation. And I'm not just praying for it, but I'm acting on it. When we tell the stories of Imam Ali, we have to tell a variety of stories. We have to tell uh, the different ways in which Imam Ali existed in his life because he wasn't just one thing and nor are we just one thing. We have to look at these stories to figure out how, when as we struggle on how, the best way to live our lives, we have this guidance, we have these examples in order to adapt and transform into our own context and turn into something more meaningful. But in addition to these stories, we have wonderful resources available to us. Um, some of uh, some of our listeners may be familiar with uh, the book Justice and Remembrance by Reza Shah Kazmi, or The Spiritual Quest, uh, also by Reza Shah Kazmi, both of which deal with the teachings of Imam Ali. But we can also go to the source. We have Najul Balaga, which is a collection of sayings, letters, sermons, teachings of Imam Ali, from which we can all learn from. And very specifically, I would turn to the letter of Imam Ali, to the man he appoints the governor of Egypt, uh, who is Malik al-Ashtar. Because in that, in that letter, I think there is such wisdom, such profound wisdom that goes not only from the time it was written, but into the present day, where Imam Ali begins to say, be forgiving because God is forgiving. And just as you seek to be met with forgiveness, you should be forgiving. You should exhibit, you should manifest that uh, that divine attribute in the world, right? So every time we say Bismillah Rahman Rahim, we think about God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. How are we compassionate? How are we merciful in the world? And then Imam Ali continues going on. He says, make room for those who have no access to you because they're the ones who are most in need of access to you. And he says, be careful of the rich, be careful of the elite because they have everything. They're ungrateful. They're not going to help you when things get tough. And they're not, they're the ones who will always be unsatisfied. Whereas it is the mass of society, if you care for them, that society functions well because everybody succeeds when the masses succeed. Right? And I think there's such power in that statement. And over and over and over again, Imam Ali makes this connection between what is in the Quran, what is in the Hadith, what is in his embodied religion and saying, this too is how we should govern. This is how we should live our lives. And it feels so urgent and so necessary, not because we're lacking that, but because it's always relevant. And for me, this is such an important part of Imam Ali's legacy. Uh, his personal legacy is thinking about the guidance on living our ethics, not at particular times, not at particular moments, but saying, I believe as a function of believing, I must act in certain ways. And this is what it means to act in that way, again, not just for myself, but for my community and for the world at large. And so for me, every time I think about Imam Ali's teachings, every time I approach Imam Ali's teachings, I have to take a step back because it forces you to breathe deeply, to think deeply, to engage with how you live in the world in a way that's not just, I'm being ethical at this moment because somebody is watching me but that God is always watching me, so how am I always ethical? Not only because I'm being watched, but because it pleases God and it is the guidance of the Imams. So this to me is, is how I engage with thinking about Imam Ali. That is such a good reminder to not only focus on a single aspect of Imam Ali, but to look at the totality of his life for guidance and meaning. I am reminded of the story from the Ta'lim curriculum about Allah being everywhere, this notion of God consciousness and how we should strive to act in a way to please him. Rina, you are so right. How do we embody Imam Ali's ethics? And, and I think that one of the important things for us is that this can't be a, a decision that we're constantly making and asking ourselves, right? What Yomi Ali does is it gives us a moment to say, how am I going to engage with the teachings of the Imams and very here's very specifically the teachings of Imam Ali in ways that it becomes instinctual and natural to me. And for me, I think that starts with the question uh, that we should all be asking ourselves, which is what does Imam Ali mean to me? 
And Rina, I want to turn that question to you and ask you, what does Imam Ali mean to you? That is a great question and one that I have been reflecting on a lot this past week, given that we have been commemorating Yome Ali. Of course, Hazrat Ali holds a really special place in our lives as our first Imam. But beyond that, I see the life and legacy of Imam Ali as an exemplar of how I want to live my life. The teachings, the stories, the lessons from his life show me how I can live faith in my daily world today as I interact with others around me. And on that note, I want to thank you, Dr. Rashid, for joining us tonight and for sharing such wonderful stories with us. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yalmud. Thank you so much, Dr. Rashid, for sharing those thoughts with us. Imam Ali's life and the family of the Prophet are truly examples to live by. And now we have a short presentation on Reza Shah Kazimi's book, Justice and Remembrance. Dr. Shah Kazimi's work, published in 2006, is the first serious book in any Western language on Imam Ali's intellectuality and spirituality. The book has filled a significant gap in the field of Islamic studies and provides an essential insight into the spirituality and ethics of Imam Ali. Please enjoy. When I was but a child, the Prophet took me under his wing. I would follow him as a baby camel follows the footsteps of its mother. Every day he would raise up for me a sign of his noble character, commanding me to follow it. He would go each year into seclusion at the mountain of Hira. I saw him and nobody else saw him. At that time, no household was brought together for the religion of Islam, except that comprising the Messenger of God, Khadija, and myself as the third. I saw the light of the revelation and the message, and I smelt the fragrance of prophecy. Through those who seek to know God, knowledge penetrates the reality of insight. They rejoice in their intimacy with the spirit of certainty. They make easy what the extravagant find harsh. They befriend that by which the ignorant are estranged. With their bodies they keep company with the world, while their spirits are tied to the transcendent realm. Thus the Akil, the true intellectual, is described by the Imam as being constantly engaged in the struggle against his own soul, against the lower inclinations, the passionate whims and distracting caprice of the lower ego. Imam Ali says justice puts everything in its right place. The first imperative of justice is to set right the individual's relationship with God. In the Imam's letter to Malik al ashtar this is summed up in the command be just with God and be just with the people. The individual's relationship with God is therefore at the heart of Imam Ali's teachings on justice. Habituate your heart to mercy for the subjects and to affection and kindness for them. Do not stand over them since they are of two kinds, either your brethren in religion or your likes in creation. So extend to them your forgiveness and pardon them in the same way you would like Allah to extend his forgiveness and to pardon you. Imam Ali and the mystical tradition of Islam focuses on the principle and the practice of dhikr Allah, the remembrance, invocation of God, arguably the most important theme of Islamic spirituality. The Imam's sayings on this theme are presented as commentaries on the Quranic notion of dhikrullah. Truly, God has made the remembrance, al-dhikr, 
a polish for the hearts by which they hear after being deaf and see after being blind and yield after being resistant. That was a great highlight of a really important book. If you're looking for your next lockdown read, you can now download the Justice and Remembrance ebook from the IIS website. Just visit iis.ac.uk slash publications slash ebooks. Before we go, I encourage everyone to tune in to the Ismaili Center conversations this Sunday on Ismaili TV. The lecture entitled Islam and Social Justice will commemorate Yome Ali with keynote speaker Dr. Hadi Inayat from the Aga Khan University's Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. This lecture will be followed by a conversation between Dr. Inayat and Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal from the Institute of Ismaili Studies. We pause here for this week's segment of COVID Conversations. This evening, we have a short clip courtesy of the CBC on an issue that we continue to get a lot of questions about, namely masks. As the guidance around masks has evolved based on our understanding of the coronavirus, and especially with the spread of the new variants, it is essential that we keep up to date with the latest guidance and make sure we are protecting ourselves and our loved ones properly. So there are these new variants of the coronavirus that emerged in the UK, South Africa, and Brazil, and they've made their way here. So you may be wondering whether you need to do anything differently with your mask. What we know about these new variants is that they're stickier. They have an easier time attaching to our cells and getting in, so that more virus ends up in our nasal and throat areas. That means with coughing and talking, there's even more virus in our droplets, and that's what makes these variants 50 to 60% more contagious. There's no reason to think that existing masks won't be effective against these new variants, but with more virus floating around, there are some things that we can and should do to up our mask game. Early in the pandemic, you might have bought one of these one-ply cotton masks or even these two-ply masks. But if you are gonna use a cloth mask, what you really need is three plies. Two layers of a tightly woven material like high thread count cotton forming a pouch where you add a filtering material like polypropylene. You can buy this or you can cut it out of one of these reusable shopping bags or you can create your own filter with a coffee filter or even a vacuum bag. But that leaves a lot of room for error. And if you're not sure if you've got the right material and the right filter, then a surgical mask like this one is a better choice. But just as important as the material is the fit. You want a snug fit to prevent air from escaping around the mask instead of through it. For example, if you wear glasses, you might have had them fog up on you while wearing a mask, and that means that too much air was escaping through the top of the mask. That's why tie masks like this one are more effective than masks with ear loops. The fit is tighter, and as you can see, my glasses don't fog up. But if you are gonna use one of these typical medical masks with ear loops, there are a few hacks that can increase the filtration efficiency from about 40% up to about 80%. The first one is knotting the ear loops and tucking in the extra pleat on the side. This simple trick will improve efficiency by about 20%. An easier option with a similar effect is to use one of these ear guards on the tightest hooks or a simple hair clip to pull those ear loops behind your head. You may also have seen people wearing two masks instead of one. That does add an extra layer and it can be helpful by making the inner mask tighter against the face, but as long as the material and the fit are adequate, a single mask is sufficient. So make sure you've got the right mask with the right fit. Keep wearing your mask consistently, keep distancing whenever possible, and we'll all get through this together. And now, as always, we end with some musical expressions. Ya Ali, Ya Ali, Ya Ali is an ode to Ali, composed in the South Asian Sufi style of Qawwali music. 
Through this piece, the artist offers praise to Imam Ali and conveys our humble love, shukrana, and devotion to the ever-present Nur of Ali. Have a wonderful week and thank you for tuning in. Ya Ali Madad.